This is the Federal Mobility Policy Update for November 13th, 2020. This week's guests are Christopher Coes from Smart Growth America and Beth Osborne from Transportation for America. This week, what will a new Biden administration look like for transportation? What are their priorities for transit, bikes, walking, and electric vehicles? Lastly, given an uncertain Congress, what would be the transportation priorities for moving forward? All that and more on this week's update. Welcome to another special edition of the Federal Mobility Policy Update. This week, with the culmination of the presidential election, so much to talk about, so much to cover. Let's get right into it. Let's uh, introduce our panel. I'll start with Christopher Coase. Chris. Hello, Christopher Coase. Uh, currently, I serve as Vice President at Smart Growth America, a national nonprofit based in Washington, D.C., that seeks to create a country where no matter who you are, where you live, you can live in a place that's healthy, prosperous, and resilient. Beth, I am joined here by my own colleague, uh, Beth Osborne. I'm Beth Osborne. I'm Director of Transportation for America. We're the transportation arm of Smart Growth America. When we're normally in the office, Christopher and I get to spend a lot of time together, but now we're across the city and we can only rely on this connection. I'll send it over to Martha. And I'm Martha Ruskowski. I am the coordinator of the Funder Collaborative on Mobility and Access and Daryl's co-host of this really fun broadcast that we do fairly often. And we'll start our broadcast as we traditionally do with quick hits. What are the things that are bubbling up that are coming to your mind that we all need to know about? We'll start with you, Christopher. My first quick hit, post-election day, Democrats didn't take back Senate. So that means the Biden administration will be the fifth term of the Obama administration. Uh, hopefully, my second quick hit is that they'll learn to only accelerate and do more with local governments and local community innovators. Those are my two. And I will add that uh, while the transition is starting out uh, a little slower than we had hoped that there's a lot of activity over there and we should pay attention to who's on that transition team as well as who ends up getting appointments that will give us a much greater sense about where this uh, new administration is headed than we have now. Um, and I will also say that with uh, Senator McConnell's announcement that he is very interested in a COVID relief package, that we're likely to see a, a lot of action when the new Congress is sworn in in January. Martha. And I will add that um, transportation initiatives were on the ballot across the country at state and local levels. Um, Eno Center for Transportation did a nice roundup of the 30 biggest ones. And of those, uh, 22 passed, eight failed. So a pretty good win-loss record for transportation initiatives at a state and local level. But there's so much to talk about at the federal level and the national level. We're gonna save that state and local conversation for our next broadcast and we'll do a deeper dive into what happened locally. That's great. Um, thank you, Martha. There's so much to unpack. Uh, a new administration is bringing up all kinds of ideas and issues. Let's try to go through them um, by the early signals that we've received. Um, the Biden administration put out a Build Back Better website for transportation and they specifically called out transit and they specifically called out what could be done within the auto industry. I'd be interested in all of your collective thinking of what did we learn? What, what, what does this document um, say about where the administration intends to go? Or at least what are the tea leaves that we need to read? Well, I'll start out by saying uh, they did a remarkable job in focusing their priorities in four topic areas not very typical of a new administration, particularly a Democratic administration. Uh, Democrats are known for having 17 priorities and 140 subparts. So this was a, a really impressive breakdown. And, you know, those uh, priorities, uh, to somewhat not a surprise, but 
COVID-19, economic recovery, racial equity, climate change. And uh, one of the things that was uh, exciting to me was seeing the, the reference amongst each to the other sections. So a lot of what they talk about with the auto industry is both with regard to climate and with regard uh, uh, to economic recovery. Same thing with other investments that they're starting to draw the line between the points of how certain investments can benefit economic recovery, racial equity, climate change, all with one in one fell swoop. And so that's, uh, that's very nice to see. Great. Christopher, what was your take on this? One, they were bringing in new talent. Two, uh, the talent that I see that uh, were on the list were people who understand intersectionality. Uh, I was really impressed like that. Uh, some of the great names that were on the transportation, but I was equally excited about the names I saw at HUD, at the Department of Commerce, because these are individuals that both Steph and I have worked with on the ground as practitioners, those who, have had, who understand that housing, transportation, economic development are all connected. Um, and I think one of the things that I'm excited about is that some of these names, and I think the direction that the, at least the transition team uh, presents to me is recognizing that intersectionality and recognizing that you have to bring the locals, the community innovators, the private sector along the way. Great. And, you know, the fact that they <laughs> honed in on cities and that they were saying that 100,000 people are more residents with, you know, zero emission public transportation options. What does that speak to? I mean, is, is the focus on cities going to be a good thing? Um, how, do you, how are you guys looking at that? It's definitely a, a, a step uh, in a positive direction. Look, cities can make mistakes too. Uh, it, it's not as simple as just give funding to cities that you do need to have a lot of the other policies that are mixed in. But it's not your typical slate that you see for a lot of these agencies. There's a lot more local representation, mm -hmm. really talented, innovative people like Phil Washington from LA Transit and Polly Trottenberg from New York City. Uh, these are people that have tried things that haven't been tried before, found success, sometimes didn't and learned from it. But these aren't people that are satisfied to fall back into the same trends we have tried and often failed at for decades upon decades. So that's really exciting to see. And some of the usual suspects aren't on the list, which also signals that maybe we want some broader thinking. We'll, we'll see some of those usual suspects uh, you know, from the highway crowd come in at some point, but they're gonna come into an environment that's asking us to do things slightly differently. And that's good for everybody, including the highway industry. Right, and I, is it unusual for the first shot out of an administration saying what they intend to, to build back better. Talk a little bit about how they were specifically talking about pedestrians, bicyclists, bus lines. Um, yeah, they were talking about rail networks, but they were talking about it as a complete system. At least that's what I was reading. Is that how the two of you see it? Yeah? Okay. No, sorry, I, I, was, I was leaving room for Christopher to jump in first. <clears throat> um, I definitely read it that way. Um, I, I uh, am very excited to, to see the way they talked about things. So like I said, you go into the climate section and they talk about um, infrastructure as, you know, that's good for the climate and creating jobs, um, creating jobs in the auto industry by making cars more efficient, um, investing in transit. I, I will say, I, I know that we're gonna talk more about um, uh, the ballot initiatives in the future, but, there are a lot of people that were ready to say the, the support for transit was over because of COVID and a whole bunch of communities came out and put new money into new transit. And this administration is seeing the call for it and, and putting support behind it. There's a lot of new polling now that shows that the support for transit is associated to some extent, I think, with getting out of this, getting back to a functioning community. So there's a lot uh, in here that is, is really exciting. I will say in, in a lot of ways, in my opinion, it's more specific than I've seen at the mm -hmm. beginning of uh, new administrations and, and it's more focused. Well, I'm just going to add. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to add to that. I think we cannot ignore uh, the fact that this administration, through their early communication, has identified racial justice as a key component. 
um, both in the transportation section, uh, the climate section, but also the racial equity, recognizing that to achieve racial equity and economic justice across the country, we have to tackle the injustice in the transportation system, the injustice in the housing injustice. So I think in many ways, to Beth point, points out, I am just really impressed that they're leaning in. And I think that's one of the things that I think you're gonna see a lot of the other transition teams actually bring, be brought together on a one umbrella. And I think the climate, the racial justice, the Build Back Brother really forcing everyone to have that same uh, focus point, I think is gonna be something we haven't seen before. Mm -hmm. A little bit about how it's tied to housing, and I, I want to get Martha's reaction. We had talked earlier about the impact on linking housing to transportation. Is that a new thing, or do you think, how is it expressed? Well, I'm glad you said that. So again, uh, the fifth year of the Obama administration, literally in the last days of their administration, uh, the White House released uh, this report of recognizing the big challenge for affordable housing was also transportation costs and identify local zoning policies and how many particularly communities that have high pedestrian fatalities lack the necessary infrastructure as well as a sustainable housing. So bringing those two worlds together, I know early on uh, my colleague uh, Beth Osborne worked with the Obama administration after a major economic disruption and help set up the Partnership of Sustainable Communities, which really, which I think this is this administration is really leaning into recognizing that we can't no longer have departments work in silos. EPA, HUD, DOT, Commerce with the Economic De uh, Development Administration, they all have dollars that can impact infrastructure, transportation, and housing. And having those dollars actually coordinate better at the local level as well as the federal level is the right way to go. I'm really excited about that. Martha, you, you want to jump in here? Uh, you, no, Daryl, you asked my question. It was the <laughs> question about uh, between transportation and housing and land use. You know, a lot of us focus on transportation. We realize pretty soon that if we don't change land use, where people live, places they're going, if we don't make short trips more possible for them, we're you know we're not going to succeed on the transportation front so well, i guess one more Martha, i will i will yeah. just quickly point out there's a great uh report that just came out from from the brookings institution mm -hmm. uh that looks at uh the connection between these things basically when when all the things you need to are built far away from where you live and you lengthen those trips you dictate whether or not people have uh, uh, different options. You know, you can build all the si sidewalks you want, but if everything you need is 10 mm -hmm. miles away, people aren't going to walk that. So, uh, uh, I'll, well, we can put it in the show notes, but it's mm -hmm. a great visual demonstration of what we've been talking about for so long. Hey, Daryl, if you give me <laughs> one, uh, one plug, I will say that uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, Smart Group America and Brookings are going to release a, uh, a report that's actually going to reveal how majority of all U.S. housing supply are actually in climate risk communities uh, that will basically over the next 20, 15, uh, 20 to 30 years be highly receptive to sea level rise and environment disasters. So not only are we talking about the future housing production, but the fact that we have over 40 million Americans today who are one Katrina, one Florence, one wildfire of being climate refugees. And we do not have a plan to address that. And right. I'm really excited that when we talk about climate, it is linked into some of these discussions uh, already. So both of you have talked about having a multi-agency or multi-departmental approach. Um, the Obama administration tried that with the Sustainable Communities Program with mixed results, good people behind it. Um, mm -hmm. What would your counsel be when that is reignited in the fifth year of the Obama, or the fifth term of the Obama administration? <laughs> What, what would you suggest? Do you have any thoughts about how we could yeah. improve that effort? Yeah. Um, one is uh, supply people with the tools to be able to determine how their investments impact those other sectors. That is yeah. uh, that is fully within uh, the capacity of the administration within their own research budgets. They can then work it into their rules and regulations. First, just making tools available so that people know is good, is good mm -hmm. help. And where they have the authority, they can require people to use that information and supply it with one another. Uh, so that can make a big difference. Uh, and then seek it in their legislative proposals. I was a part of the Obama administration. And while it was wonderful for the agencies to meet and talk, it doesn't do you any good if you don't actually put it into your documents, your systems. Basically, I think we made a 
very similar mistake that the Clinton administration made with FEMA uh, under James Lee Witt, where a, a great uh, group of people and, and big personalities made people feel like there was change because there was good leadership, but failed to make that change uh, have lasting impacts. And we can't assume that agencies will always have great leadership. And I'll just add, um, I one of my privileges at Smart of America is working with the private sector. And one of the things I saw in the last year of the Obama administration, particularly through the Ladders of Opportunity Initiative at DOT, where they actually used their bully pulpit, recognizing they weren't going to get any more money from Congress, using their bully pulpit at the local level, bringing in the mayors, bringing in the developers, and bringing the community together and saying, how can we transform this old highway infrastructure? How can we transform this uh, uh, unutilized transit access and convert it to a much more sustainable, much more uh, profitable and also equitable community? I believe that is something particularly now in, with the recognition in the private sector around the importance of climate change, the recognition in the private sector about how we should be engaging in racial justice. There, the private sector is asking, where should we put our money? The Biden administration has to lean into that and use their bullet pulpit to, when Congress fails, go out into the streets and bring the, bring the people with you. So no, is part of this um, performance measures, I mean, I've been thinking about like, what's the, you know, we have a split Congress, at least mm -hmm. so far. So not really high aspirations of them doing a lot quickly around transportation, perhaps outside of stimulus. But it does seem like within the administration, within the existing legal framework, there's quite a bit that the, an administration could do. So are you talking about things like performance measures where it, we actually identify the outcomes that we want and then work to that rather than just keep dumping money into what we've done all along that isn't really getting us outcomes that we want? Absolutely. There are, uh, there are performance measures like what we talk about in the transportation program. And, and one of the recommendations I would have for a new Biden administration is to reintroduce the rule that was final mm -hmm. to have state DOTs measure the greenhouse gas emissions. Just mm -hmm. right off the bat, just reinstate that. Um, but there's also a lot of uh, in the weeds measures that we require transportation agencies to use that undo the very policies we claim we want them to pursue. Just basic things like pretending that someone can measure 20 year traffic projections. It's, it's absolutely silly. We are incapable of knowing that. You have to know what the economy will be like to know what your traffic's gonna be like. Um, and we don't know that a year out. So it's just some of these requirements result in people making crazy projections and then building the crazy projections. There are dozens of things like that within the agency that could be taken on. But I would also say we need to update our priors. There are a lot of us that are working and, and by the time you're in your career where you can get into an administration job, you might be a little bit older and you might be carrying a lot of baggage with you about what is, um, uh, you know, what is possible and what's not. I mean, I have lost a lot, I understand, and I bring that baggage to a lot of conversations, but what I've learned at Transportation for America is there's actually a new conversation going on out there. Transit is way more bipartisan than it used to be. We saw that with the CARES Act. Um, we also find that Fix It First is extremely bipartisan with a little more support from the right than from the left. I can tell you access to jobs there's not a human being that disagrees that that should be a measure for transportation. There's so much in here that actually has possibility, but I do find particularly on the Democratic side, people walk in with this skittishness that talks them out of opportunity that is right in front of them. Right, you know, I hear that a lot of like, oh, we tried that before and it didn't work. Mm -hmm. And yet mm -hmm. you realize that, you know, times change. And sometimes the ground that wasn't fertile before, you know, it's ready to move on that. So but I do- We haven't had a, a 100 year pandemic before either. So, you exactly. know, like maybe we can revisit a, a couple of assumptions. Yeah. yeah, you know, I saw a stat recently that 11,000 restaurants are using the streets in New York City. Mm -hmm. And, and that is intrinsically tied to their economic success. Whereas before right. the pandemic, the, the two parking spots that they would mm -hmm. have had was what they mm -hmm. believed was their lifeline. There's an experience here that they've had that will change this.
Yes. And like, the thing is, it's not just the New Yorks of the world. It is actually yeah. every rural downtown and community. And those who did not are saying, wow, we need to get that type that. of infrastructure. We need to and do that. probably 99% of them pre-pandemic would have, like you say, mm -hmm. gone ballistic if you talked about using their parking for something else. And now they're like, hey, this is pretty cool. Feels kind of mm -hmm. European. Woohoo. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, I anticipate we'll see some really interesting things over the winter, making the outdoors a, a more mm -hmm. delightful space uh, during the dark and cold months. Uh, my, my own sister lives in northern Sweden and talks about these incredible practices that make being out of doors when the sun goes down at three totally acceptable. And I think mm -hmm. we're going to see that because it's going to... I mean, people are going to depend on it uh, for their lifeblood. But, you know, Christopher and I are really cut from the same mold on a lot of these issues where we don't see the same uh, partisan blockages to a lot of these efforts mm -hmm. that others do. And a lot of it is because uh, we just had really successful relationships with Republicans on so many of these issues. We just don't see our peers digging into them quite the same way we have. Yeah. Okay. So let's change gears just a little bit. Um, uh, there were some announcements about the Biden transition team. Um, you know, interesting things coming there. What, what do you read from those tea leaves? Know that we're all kind of speculating, but you guys are sort of expert speculators from interesting vantage points. So what is, a, what is the transition, you know, what's been talked about so far? What is that indicating to you? Uh, Science matters. Expertise <laughs> matters. <laughs> uh, and I, I think that's the, the, my major takeaway. I mean, I've, I've tried my best, and Beth and I have to do this every day, working with the administration to move the larger smart growth and transportation initiatives forward. And you recognize that there are just people who just don't do this work, but they're in the position of making the decisions. And particularly now, with where we're seeing this current administration, the president-elect, we are returning to some level of normalcy uh, in the fact that you have people who believe in data. I, if you, one of the things I was just really excited about, the, a lot of the folks do their, uh, their rumors are people who come from the data uh, side of the ledger uh, and who have real life experience. I will also say, and I wonder what my colleague uh, Beth will, uh, uh, whether she agree with me, is that it's still too early to tell because one of the things that we don't know is the fact that uh, regardless of the names that are floated, they're being floated for a reason as trial balloons. And until we know who controls the Senate, uh, all of this is kind of like smoke and mirrors. But I do think the names that they're, uh, they're releasing uh, do give us a clear indication. And I know my colleague Beth will have some more thoughts on that. I mean, I 100% I agree with that. I, I mentioned a couple of folks on the transition I was excited about before, but there's really an incredible list here. Uh, you've got, you know, people like Jeff Marudian, who's mm -hmm. from uh, the DC Department of Transportation and Therese McMillan with the Metropolitan Transportation Commission and Gabe Klein from City mm -hmm. Fi, and you've got yeah. uh, from academia and yeah. from the labor. And it's just, it's a, a really nice group of people with some really interesting backgrounds and, uh, and that's exciting. But Who's on the transition team doesn't necessarily line up with who is then appointed. Uh, sometimes people want to steer things in the right direction, but they're not putting themselves forward. Other times you do see people come from the transition team. And I think what we're going to see over the next month, we'll definitely see cabinet level people announced mm -hmm. pretty quickly between now and the end of the year. But what's really going to tell us about the direction of this new administration is who falls underneath that. Um, you know, the deputy secretaries and assistant secretaries and at DOT, the modal administrators and their assistants. Well, all these people will matter a ton because the lead will manage out. They're the ones who work with the White House and work with Congress mm -hmm. and talk to the press. Mm -hmm. And they really focus on spreading the message. It's the rest that actually do the work within. You're not going to see a secretary digging through, uh, you know, a regulation to approve it or, uh, you know, uh, running a working group about what to do with the level of service standard. That's not, that's not a secretary's job. Mm -hmm. So I think we should wait and watch. We'll get some good indications to come. We also need to remember that this process does not proceed super quickly. And if the Republicans in, uh, if they're leading the Senate decide to be truly obstructionist, it will go even slower. Um, I would argue that the administration, the Biden administration should be prepared for that and have a, a, a wheel for acting. Mm -hmm. Just be prepared to make these things function no matter what. But 
when I was in DOT under the Obama administration, I was the 12th person, 12th to 15th person on board. Um, uh, the, we didn't have a deputy until summer. We didn't have an uh, assistant secretary until near fall. I, it, it takes a long time for this to get filled out. So there's a lot of opportunity for us to, to give our opinions and our thoughts. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of opportunity to help fill in uh, the blanks after the leadership is announced. Well, one of the things I will just add to that is that we cannot also take our eyes off the fact that we are still in a lame duck session and presidents always, no matter Democrat or Republican, lie to get things, particularly executive orders and rulemaking in those last months. And one of the things I was really uh, uh, glad that there are many veterans on the transition team who can ask the right questions and kind of peek around the corner to see where some of these new regs and some of these uh, executive orders are landing. And so when the new team, whether it's a new secretary, assistant secretary, they actually have a good playbook of how to unravel some of those, uh, uh, what may be anti-transit or other provisions uh, when they get in. They, they have like a punch list coming in the door. Yeah. And yeah. they already announced they plan to show up and issue a whole bunch of actions on day one. So. Exactly right. Exactly right. Yeah, there was... I have wondered about the um, uh, just the damage that has been done to agency readiness and competence. And it seems like, you know, a lot of folks that I knew in, you know, at FHWA at USD have left, like they soldiered on for as long as they could. And Mm -hmm. But there has really been a, you know, a real loss of expertise from those departments. What do you think? Like, how long, how quickly can that get built back to a basic level of functionality? Uh, you know, that's a, a good question. I, I actually think that once they get a, a minimum number of appointments in, um, not all of whom need congressional approval, Senate approval, um, the, you've got a bunch of people able to start to steer this. I will say something that I get great encouragement from is the number of times in transition memos, uh, one, we'll have one going up tomorrow, um, uh, that talks about staff capacity and rebuilding mm -hmm. it. So it's definitely front of mind for a lot of people. I would fully anticipate to see hundreds of jobs go out uh, this spring, possibly thousands into the summer. Um, and I think one thing that this is going to force us to do, which is long overdue, is figure out how to make those hires happen faster. Um, mm -hmm. the, the process to hire at the federal government comes from a day and has protections that I understand, but it comes from a day where people took a job and then worked their way up and spent their whole career in one place. And to be competitive at, at, in the federal government, we have to know that the way people build a career now is to jump around. That's the only way you move up. And so we want that talent to move in and out of government and go out and take their government experience to private experience and then take the private experience back to government. That is a really healthy way to grow a workforce. And we do need to figure out a way to maintain the protections we intend to be in the law without hampering the federal government to operate their staff according to modern uh, realities. So to what extent is the Senate a governor on the speed by which, I mean, there are a certain number of positions that require Senate confirmation, but do you think it's possible to bring in a set of, you've, you've talked about the a class of people, these operatives, I don't mean that in a pejorative sense, I mean, people who know how to make things move, those engineers of the system, is it possible to bring them in faster without having to go through all the or do you oh, need yeah. the confirmation process up front? No, you can hire special mm -hmm. assistants. A lot of mm -hmm. the deputy assistant secretaries are not uh, Senate confirmed. You can put people in acting roles. And like I said, mm -hmm. there's no, look, we're, we're making up new rules to a great extent. There's no reason why you can't cycle th people through acting mm -hmm. roles to just keep the, mm -hmm. even keep the same team there. Um, right. But yeah, look, first off, I will say we don't know for sure that the Senate, a, a Republican managed Senate would be that obstructionist. There's a lot of assumptions, but I've started hearing Republican senators say uh, the president should get his picks. So I, I know that people feel burnt and are now assuming the worst of everyone, but you know, let's, let's wait and see just a little bit there. We should be prepared. Uh, as Dan Pfeiffer often says, worry about everything, panic about nothing, be prepared for the worst, but you know, we can still hope for the best. So we've had, yeah. transportation, we've had transportation sectors like Mineta, who was a, Democrat in a Republican administration, and Ray LaHood was a Republican in a Democratic administration. 
Um, do you think that's a good thing? Uh, do you feel like it's it's sometimes people say it's a gimme to say that you're bipartisan, but that you limit who you have by doing an opposite party? What is both of your take on that? I mean, is it something we should expect or is that a good well, idea? Well, since one idea? of us have actually been under that uh, that scenario, I'm gonna let them go first and I'll just <laughs> say <laughs> I was I was really curious to hear what you were gonna say, Christopher. <laughs> Um, I will say that if it is perfunctory, it's foolish. If mm -hmm. you can find someone of the other party that will, will uh, you know, move the agency in the direction you want to go, then great. Ray LaHood was incredible. Mm -hmm. um, he, he, uh, he didn't believe in a lot of the old rules and did try to, to move things in a different direction. He raised issues that we hadn't talked about before, like distracted driving. And just in terms of his management style, uh, I've been very lucky in my bosses over the years, and he's one of them, who um, when he hired staff, he then, he hired them because he had faith in them, and then he really let them spread their wings and soar, and that brought out the best in everyone. So look, if they can find uh, a, a Republican leader, and there are some mm -hmm. who, you know, believe that uh, it's time for the transportation program to move into the 21st century, that we can have more up-to-date tools, that we can update our standards, that we can expect better outcomes, and that is going to bring in other talent and manage the agency well. Why, I, like, I, I want the talent, and right. that mm -hmm. talent can be Republican or Democrat, and frankly, we can have bad from both parties too. So let's just exactly. focus on getting the talent and, and let the parties fall where they may. But if all we're doing is trying to check a, a box that we hired a Republican, that's a, that's just not, that's not an effective way to make right. change. Agreed. Your, your take, Chris. Chris uh, so I'm the one person in this particular call who did not have to work in government, but got to work with government. And I want to echo what Beth said, but with only a slight twist, what are my job, you know, job description requirements uh, for any future Secretary of Transportation, Secretary of HUD? Can you build partnerships with folks outside of Washington? Increasingly, it's those secretaries who recognize that your value add to any president is building political coalitions to move the agenda forward. Right. And I think in many ways, as we discussed before, whether it's mobility, whether it's uh, disparities in infrastructure, you yeah. need someone who has the skill set to bring those coalitions together, who can bring the mayors, who can bring rural communities, who can bring city council members in the private sector. If you don't have that skill set, then I don't know why you're getting hired. Sure. Yeah. That makes sense. I did not realize that we have three recovering bureaucrats and you're not one, <laughs> you're not one of them. That's why I'm a special guest. <laughs> oh, that's right. That makes you the special guest. Yeah, the, the person, the only person who has Mr. Scarbay working in a bureaucracy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Congratulations. That's uh, why you're still sparkly, Christopher. I exactly. Know, I know. <laughs> well, but um, I, I will say one of the things that uh, Christopher has uh, made one of his specialties is being the grand translator between the bureaucrats and the private sector. And a lot of the events that he and Locus, his organization <laughs> hosts, is bringing the local governance officials together with the, uh, uh, the developers and helping them understand what each other's saying. And they find right. out that a lot of times they think they're saying the same thing they're not. And other times they think they're saying something different and they aren't. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, it, 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 actually we should probably get this guy in government. We can use it. Yeah, no, it's kind of like parking. like. Developers don't necessarily <laughs> want to put in parking. Let's not have parking, right? Um, right. It's like, we're not a problem. It's actually exactly. it. so yeah. like, Oh, let's look at the target. Um, <laughs> let's convince it about urban form. Before we close out, there's one other thing that I would love to get both of your take on. I, I don't think I've ever seen a transition document or a document which expressly calls out electric vehicles. I think that's a watershed that they're actually acknowledging the need for vehicle charging infrastructure and electric vehicles. And, it, and it's part of a jobs plan. What, what is both of your take on that? Do you think that's a good thing? Do you think it's complete and fulsome or do you think it's just um, performative? Um, yeah. Uh, I don't want to say that's thunder, but I'm going to try. Um, it's a, I call it climate change 1.0 solution. Yes, it's low hanging fruit, but any serious uh, 
uh, studier of how we're, we as a society are going to address climate change. It's now going to be retrofitting our you know, distribution system up for energy uh, AVs. It's going to be connecting our transportation policies to our land use development policies because the fundamental issue here is people are driving too much. It's hurting them economically. It's hurting them from a, a health standpoint. It's also hurting us from a racial segregation standpoint. And so, yes, great idea. It's a low hanging fruit. It brings people along on a journey, but I will tell you uh, that is not going to be the final answer on how we create a more integrated society that addresses climate change. Right, right. And I, I say the same thing I always say, electric vehicles are absolutely essential. We cannot do what we need to do without them. They're just not sufficient. So I hope that we're not raising this as a way, as a, a silver bullet strategy. Right. Silver bullet strategies always fail. We wouldn't mm -hmm. do this in building efficiency. We wouldn't say make the HVAC system great and, and leave the windows mm -hmm. open. Um, mm -hmm. We can't do that in transportation. But bringing the American auto industry into exactly. uh, a solution that will make not only uh, our, our environment cleaner and people healthier and, and address catastrophic uh, global climate change, but it can help make our industry international leaders again. Well, that, that's wonderful. Of course we want to do that. And, right. and I, I'm super excited to see it. Great. Um, so we've got a wild card question. Um, it's premised on uh, a series of tweets from Billy Fleming from the McHarg Center, who said, and he worked in the Obama administration for the stimulus. And, you know, if anyone's aspirational is Billy Fleming, he also said that we can do a little, even with, if we have both Senate and the House, we can do a little. We would be well advised in the first few years to think about two or three things we can get and push hard to get them to show that we can be successful. So I would ask each of you, what are those two or three things? <laughs> so I, I, I guess one of the things I'd like to understand is uh, is exactly what he means by a little. I knowing mm -hmm. Billy, I'm guessing he means policy wise because he's a, a policy geek like all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas I think you think most people would define it in terms of money value. Um, but I I do think if we're if we're very careful, uh, we could actually get more by by focusing then you know trying to get everything done at once uh, again I, I think those who are looking to change the world often try to do so much that they can't properly manage it all so um you know in a stimulus bill i think we need to remind ourselves of all the lessons learned in the recovery act mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. one is the way we put the money out in, with the goal of it going out quickly did not mm -hmm. result in it being spent quickly and did not result in the outcomes we hoped. we did not pick the projects that created the jobs the fastest mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we need to learn those lessons i don't want to hear the word shovel ready i can't mm -hmm. tell you how much time i spent being beaten up for that word because it didn't work if you are in a governmental institution, you do not go hire a hundred new people to run new money faster based on a one-time thing. So what we should be thinking about as we go forward, especially in a stimulus atmosphere, is how do we start to build, uh, to, to give some assurance to both private industry and government to help them build out over the long haul and in a way where we see the imprint of the investment for years and decades to come, rather than just say, look, we spent a lot of money. Um, I second everything to what Beth just said. Um, the th only thing I would add is I agree. Um, there are a lot of things you potentially do, uh, big, that's very narrow. I mean, for example, there's a TOD loan program at USDOT, about $20 billion has been sitting on the sidelines. Uh, this current administration has yet to approve any transit or development or equitable TOD project. That's an easy win. You can find $20 billion of equitable, affordable housing projects across the country. But even then, I don't think that is what I would put my finger on. I honestly believe the thing that this administration has to like go, as I say, ham um, on now is the time to enlist America. 
if I, I recall of uh, JFK, we said, look, we're going to do build things. We're not going to do it. Maybe not be able to get it done in my tenure, but it will get done. So let's do it. Americans have been asked to wear a mask as a contribution to the social contract. I believe fundamentally from the private sector to community innovators to mayors who are out there trying to save lives, build more transit options, bring more affordable housing are just waiting for a federal partner. So I actually think the biggest thing that this administration could do that could be game changing is literally enlist the American people in a national community mobilization that actually targets one project per region that literally checks climate, racial, and uh, job creation, and use those as, and I say, look, I count votes. You, from 2024, there are projects that, can, that are, could be potentially ready that really show what America could look like together. Without it, you're just having another top-down discussion and hoping that someone listens. If you right. don't bring the people along, we'll be right back in a uh, eighth-term administration, uh, the last year of administration, looking at something totally different. Amen. Perfect. Okay. What's yours? What, what, what are your two or three things you think? Um, you know, I'm really intrigued by performance measures. I think they are, it, it, it sounds wonky and weird, but if we actually said our objective is to address climate, it's to increase equity, it's to increase safety, it's to increase access. To measure uh, those things. You know, pardon? <laughs> we should measure those things. We should. <laughs> To actually measure those things, and let's make sure that all these billions of dollars that we're, you know, that we're pouring into transportation projects, that those projects are actually measured against that. Currently, we measure them against nothing, right? We measure them against like, oh, how much money did we shovel out the door into the construction industrial complex? So, I um, that's what I'm excited about. Let's align that. I mean, any business will tell you you need to identify what your objectives are. And they need to be measurable objectives. Mm -hmm. So we need objectives for our transportation system. I, I'd be excited if we could move from level of service to VMT, like the way California did. And it feels like that's ready to go. That's happened. And so if we started programming dollars that way, that would be a big get. I think it would dramatically change the way transportation looks. Um, so... I want to thank each of you for being on today's broadcast. Christopher, thank you. You were a great addition. As always, Beth, you were so good. And Martha, it's always been great having you as a colleague and, and a co-host on the show. Um, we'll put the show in the show notes. We'll put some of the links to what we've talked about. We look forward to looking for both for your report, Christopher, that you're doing with Brookings. Um, and we hope to have you back on another show to unpack what that's about. Uh, and um, we want to thank everyone. Have a good day.